I'm Abby Schlesinger. I'm a child and adolescent psychiatrist. I'm the chief of child and adolescent psychiatry and integrated care at um, UPMC Children's and UPMC Western Psych. And I'm here today with... I'm Madeline and I'm a 10th grade high school student. And her mother, Michelle. So what are some signs or symptoms parents should be aware of if they suspect their child or teen is suffering from depression? So uh, the first thing that you need to be concerned about um, is whether or not a child or adolescent just stops doing the things they normally do. Um, I a lot, oftentimes hear teenagers say, teenagers' parents say to me things like, well, teenagers are always in their bedroom and sort of moody. How would I know? <laughs> um, how you know is that they change and nobody knows a teenager better than their parent. Um, maybe their teenager's friends know additional things about them. But uh, when parents come to me saying, I knew something changed about my child, that's a sign that it's time to get help. Most parents ha are keyed into their children in some way. They may not be keyed in the second something happens. <laughs> um, oftentimes it takes a little bit of time, but, um, but parents know their kids better than anything. And, um, you know, I work with pediatricians a lot and uh, I always encourage them to really listen closely when parents say, hey, something has changed about my child, about how they're interacting with me or their friends or whether or not they want to do things um, that they used to do. And, and that's really a sign that getting help um, from a professional might make a difference. We often talk about what do you do if you think your child um, or even a friend might be struggling with depression um, or anxiety. And one thing we recommend is that you just ask, how are things going? I've noticed something has changed, right? Very simple question to ask. Mm -hmm. um, and that can really, just opening up the door uh, can make the difference. You know, not every teenager is gonna respond the second you ask them, how are things going? Um, there are, uh, little tricks of the trade, which many parents know already, but one is uh, sort of doing it when they're captured in a car or something. Um, and just, you're just sort of having a natural conversation and not doing it if they don't want to talk, right? Like if they're having a good time, you know, jiving with their music and enjoying themselves or even sort of listening to sad music and don't want to talk, uh, giving them some space to say, okay, I've noticed something changes. I want to talk. When would you like to talk? So sort of giving them some control um, instead of saying like, you know, I have my 10 minutes before bed and we need to talk now. That doesn't really work. What can I do if my child or a family member is not willing to seek help for their anxiety or depression? So if you have a friend or a family member and for a parent, if your child um, is struggling and you notice things have changed, uh, the first thing is to open the line of communication and mention the options, right? So there are options. One is we could um, we could work on things together, right? We could try to get outside and do things more together. We could try to, um, we call it activation in behavioral health, which is just get out of bed, which is hard these days when people are doing school from bed. <laughs> um, so we can just get out of bed and do things together and say, and 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 add to, if we can't do that, maybe that's a sign we should talk to our pediatrician um, or talk to um, if you uh, belong to a congregation, talk to a, an elder in your congregation or maybe even a coach. So you don't have to start with going to a behavioral health provider. You could actually start with someone closer um, and getting feedback, allowing the teenager or a friend to get feedback about um, how they're doing and what other choices might be for help. I have to say, uh, I see a number of adolescents who came into treatment because their friends recommended it to them. Or their friends said, you know, like I went to see that therapist down the street and they weren't that bad, right? <laughs> so um, it's true that kids and adolescents really listen to their peers. Um, so you can take advantage of that as a parent by saying like, hey, have you talked to your friends about this, right? And that takes it out of your hands a little bit and that scares parents. but. Um, it can help to open the line of communication.
we are used to as as people we do better when we can sort of predict what's going on sort of plan things right <laughs> um plan fun things like the way the end of my sophomore year or freshman year might go right um look forward to milestones and i think what happened last year and continues to happen is that it's getting harder and harder to know what it's going to be like next month or to even say you're going to have what you thought was a quote typical year so the positive of that is that you're learning how to deal with uh, change but it also means that that you're having loss right you're feeling like things were ripped away from you. That's such a powerful word, right? Not just taken away, but ripped away. I can imagine a piece of paper sort of slashed in half, right? <laughs> and when you rip a piece of paper, there are like jagged edges, right? <laughs> and what I see in everyone now, I would say parents, children, you name it, adolescents, is those jagged edges sort of showing off everywhere, right? Like people are frustrated and irritated and maybe even more irritated with each other than they used to be. And the little things are big things. Um, and, you know, that is a sign of depression and anxiety um, and might be a sign that you need to see a therapist. Um, but it might also be a sign that you need to sort of slow down and reconnect with your family and your friends, right? So I also often say, like, disconnect from the phone and the TV and all the stuff online and reconnect with the people that you do see on a regular basis. And that's, it's really hard to do these days, huh? So I just wanna ask, on top of the normal everyday stresses of being a teen, the year of 2020 is presenting us with some new challenges. We're now having to navigate the stressful and ever-changing world of COVID-19 while we're already feeling down. What are some ways we can combat the loads of both these challenges at the same time? And it turns out there are a number of things you can do, which is the good news. So um, this has been traumatic over the last year, right? Um, we throw the word trauma around a lot in psychiatry, but this has been tough for us um, as a people, everyone. It's tough for me, I'm sure your mom and you. And But we know when people have trauma, there's certain things that their body does in response to trauma that you can purposely do the opposite thing to promote resilience, which means to do better over the long haul. So when people have trauma happen, their body wants to slow down, lay down, disconnect, um, physically sort of eat more, <laughs> um, all of these things. By doing the opposite of those reactions, you can actually improve your chance of being more resilient over time. So if your body wants to slow down, do nothing, do the reverse of it. You get up, you move around, you jump up and down occasionally, you dance. Um, you know, we don't have the, uh, teenagers don't have the ability to go to these events where the, some teens would just be crazy and run around, right? That's part of being younger. Um, sometimes we just need to have dance parties at home. Uh, if it's alone, fine. I, I've had dance parties with my kids. This is what we do. <laughs> um, or just get up and walk around when it's nice outside. If you want to disconnect, you need to reconnect, right? So if trauma is making you feel like you want to disconnect, like I can't handle hearing one more school shutdown, I just want to disconnect. Well, you need to disconnect from the phone and the news and all those other things and reconnect with people. Um, and if that means that you're using the phone to talk to your friends, that's totally cool, as long as your parents say it's okay right then. <laughs> um, but also reconnecting with your family, um, playing video games, playing board games with your family, um, coming up with things that you can do um, to commemorate the good things in life. Uh, so the other thing that when people go through stress, they lose their sense of time and space. Um, days seem like they go forever, minutes seem sometimes like they're hours. Um, and a way to combat that is to have clear, um, clear ideas about how your day is going to work and things to look forward to. So it's very simple stuff. Have a wake up time, eat your meals at a normal time or whatever normal for you is, right? But have them scheduled and do them um, and have a bedtime, whatever that is. Uh, these very simple things help you combat your, your body's sort of loss of time and space. And then a, a very uh, useful thing to do is also think about happy events that, that might be coming up that maybe would have been different in other times and plan some other way to com commemorate it or something else fun to do.
there's so many things parents can do for teenagers. Even though teenagers do look to peers a lot, they really do listen to their parents um, and hear what they say. Um, and they really follow what they do, right? So I always say the first thing that a parent needs to do is check their own pulse and make sure they're doing okay, right? So take care of themselves. It's hard to do when you're stressed about your child and you're wanting to make sure everything's perfect for them. But if you, if you want to model healthy behavior, you're the first place to start, right? So check and see how you're doing. If you're not sure as a parent that you're how you're doing, because life is so crazy, ask someone you're close to. If you have a spouse, ask them. If you have a BFF, ask your best friend. Um, ask someone who knows you and say, hey, how do you think I'm doing? Like, how do you think things are going? And do you think I should be getting help or that I should be spending more time focusing on me? So relying on your social network is really, really important right now. Um, especially as we're, as we get more worried about our children, sometimes we forget to do that for us. And um, if we don't do it for us, then, then our children are not going to thrive. Um, then once you check your own pulse and, and get help for yourself and take care of yourself, uh, things you can do are help your children um, sort of organize their days. Um, right now during the pandemic, it's becoming very easy for teenagers to become like legitimate night owls and up all night long and sleeping all day. And um, that's not actually that healthy for most kids. Um, but having an open conversation with your child about their sleep patterns, their wake patterns, certainly for a teenager, um, of Madeline's age, you want to have a conversation with her, not just say, this needs to be the time you go to bed, but say, when do you think you should be going to bed? What should our pattern be for the day? Uh, because what a teenager doesn't have is the life experience, right? To know that if you just let yourself get off kilter, that it may take months to get back on. <laughs> so what you want to say is, let's think together about when should we be eating? When should we be sleeping? Um, and if they've gotten off kilter, helping them to get back. Uh, finally, the fun stuff, like hang out with your kids. Try to have fun with your kids. If you're so stressed you can't have fun, get help somewhere else. Um, but but just try to have fun and plan, plan time to have fun because when we're stressed, uh, sometimes we lose that in the overall scheme of things. One of, one of my, um, my biggest hobby, I would say, is musical theater and in normal times, there would be a lot of in-person classes and more performance opportunities, but COVID has sort of um, taken that away from a lot of people who have similar interests to me. And I actually do have a question about that. What are some things that kids like me can do to fill that social connection void? So not being around people is, is tough. Um, I think most people have noticed that because we're social beings, but also losing your, um, your activities is not easy. Um, one thing we recommend is even if you don't have an activity, uh, connecting with those people involved in that activity uh, as a way, even though you can't do it in person, if you could do it online or we've all learned how to use Zoom um, as a way to just connect and reminisce or even start to think about other ways you can participate without doing the formal way. That, that's one good way. It's not the same as getting together and putting on a production in person, but it is something you can do to keep the connection to those people and to keep the connections to those people that share your interests, right? Because that's what a, lo what a lot of us has, have also missed, right? It's not just being on Zoom with people, it's being on Zoom with someone who also loves what I love, right? Um, and we, even though we're not besties, we can talk about it. And we can talk about all the fun things of the things we love. So stay connected over the internet, certainly a way to do it. Cause like parents can't um, fill the whole void. While social media can help us stay connected while social distancing, it can also negatively impact your mental health. What are some of the things you can do to reduce the risk of social media having a negative impact on you or your child's health? I think the first thing about social media, uh, not to start from a negative, but I think it's an important thing to remember, is that sometimes people use it as a way to just disconnect, you know, like when you're just scrolling and not thinking <laughs> um, and maybe just only sort of responding things that are that make you irritated or make you angry. If it's use, if you're using it as a way to disconnect, that's not healthy. Um, so the first thing might be to have uh, time that you use social media. 
so a specific time. And uh, that's got to be a, a communication between adolescent and parent about that, right? So it may be that there are, that it's not like a small amount of time, right? Because I bet you're on social media a lot, Madeline, you're a teenager. Um, and a lot of adults are too. So it's not saying like you can only use it 10 minutes a day, but saying like, can we schedule other times we do other things, right? So, um, so we're not just using social media every time there's a break, um, every time there's nothing to do. Um, and then I think having conversations about social media and how it's going. So um, some of the biggest stressors related to social media for teens, I think, are when bullying happens or when things are being said and people don't know how to respond to it, whether or not it's coming against your teen or a friend or even like not even a friend, just someone else that's on it. So just opening a line of communication. And I think it's honest as a parent to say like, hey, I don't even understand all the things you do on social media. Could you teach me? Um, and could you tell me what's good about it for you? Like, what do you love? Could you also tell me what's hard about it for you? Like, what makes you stressed about being on it? And how can we work together to make it as positive as possible? So, uh, you know, we often joke, teenagers stay like two or three steps ahead of us when it comes to all of these things. So there are lots of things online about so, uh, how to protect your child from social media. In fact, we're e even educating people down to kindergarten these days about social media and online presence. Um, but by the time a kid's a teenager, they're no longer a kid <laughs> um, and they come with their own experiences and their own knowledge. So really starting that communication about how they're using social media and even who they're communicating with social, on social media, I think it's a good idea even with teenagers to make sure that they actually uh, know everyone they're communicating with on social media, which is even more complicated these days with the pandemic, right? Because we used to say, did you meet this person in the real world? And that was one of the things. Well, now there may be teens that you've never met in the real world, you've only ever seen over um, online experiences. So it requires more of a conversation. How are things going? Are there areas where the social media is stressing you out or making you sad? I think it's also reasonable to say, have you noticed anyone else getting stressed out or sad in social media? Um, because that can happen and then overwhelm teenagers. It can overwhelm parents, quite frankly. <laughs> um, but opening that line of communication, asking how it's going and, um, and intervening if things are really getting difficult. But I think most of social media has been positive. <laughs> um, it's really an outlet for our adolescents these days. So um, it's just like any other positive thing. It requires uh, parental interest and um, walking that line between supervision um, and giving them space to learn. Thank you so much, Dr. Schlesinger. I know I learned so much. I think my mom learned a lot too. This was very, very beneficial today. Um, so thank you for your time. And remember to go like and subscribe to our YouTube channel, Navigating Teen Life, and follow us on Instagram. And together, as always, we're Navigating Teen Life. <laughs>